Well, uh, Baptism Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays of the year, and I must say I'm a little more hesitant than normal because it's only 70 degrees, and it's been hot for the last like two weeks straight, and then of course, when it comes to baptisms, it's going to be cold out today, but uh, it's not the coldest it's ever been. Uh, ben Harker has the record for the coldest baptism. I can't remember if his was at the end of September or the beginning of October. Do you remember? It was October. It was October. I just know it was cold, and my legs were numb when we got out of the lake. So he still holds the record. It's not, it won't be that bad this morning, I promise. We will be tough and we'll survive um, the lake this morning. But, uh, man, it's, it's right up there, honestly, with other weeks like even Easter and uh, just one of the joys of, of being a pastor is being able to baptize people and watch them follow the Lord in obedience. And uh, just what a joy. It's right up there with Easter and uh, doing weddings for people and even doing funerals is, is also um, a, a joy for a pastor. But it's, it's right up there for me. And, of course, we are Ambassador Baptist Church. And so uh, here at Ambassador Baptism is kind of a big deal for us. Uh, it's kind of a big deal for Baptists. It's not the biggest deal, right? The biggest deal, of course, is the gospel. Baptism is not the gospel. The biggest deal is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul writes to 1 Corinthians, and he says in chapter 15, I write to you that which is of utmost importance. And he does not say that you should go get baptized. Rather, he says that Jesus Christ died was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. So the gospel is of utmost importance. It's also why Jesus didn't tell the thief on the cross he had to get off of the cross and go get baptized real quick before he could meet him in paradise. No, the gospel of Jesus Christ is enough to save. And yet, we do think that baptism is still important. It's something that we should emphasize, that we should rightly celebrate together this morning. So what I want to do, hopefully quicker than a regular sermon, we'll see how that goes, but uh, hopefully somewhat quickly this morning, I'd like to just give you a few thoughts to think about when you think about baptism and what God's word says about baptism and what we believe here at Ambassador about baptism. And so uh, this morning I have four truths to remember about baptism. The first truth is simply that baptism is commanded. Baptism is commanded. So our being baptized is actually a matter of obedience to Christ. If we claim to be a follower of Christ, we should follow and obey the command that we are given to be baptized. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. You guys, if you have grown up in church or been in church very much, you've probably heard this particular passage. It's called the Great Commission. And in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, Jesus says to the disciples, this is the risen Christ speaking to the disciples not too long before he ascends back to the, the throne of God. But he says in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And I will be transparent with you this morning. You, you might think, well, as you look at that, at that text in, in verse 19, you see four commands. Go, make disciples, baptize, and then verse 20, teach. But well, that actually is not true. Only one of those is technically an imperative or a command of something that we need to do. And the one that is the command is make disciples. That's the only imperative that we find in these two verses. All of those other ones, the going, the baptizing, and the teaching are called participles. They are words that describe a verb. And so we make disciples by going. We make disciples by baptizing, by 
teaching. That's all involved in the process of disciple making. And so my wife might tell me to wash the dishes because I've been putting it off and just waiting to see if she'll do it instead of being a good husband. And in washing the dishes, I'm supposed to soak them or get them wet, scrub them, dry them, and put them away. Okay, the scrubbing, the drying, the putting away, those would be the participles, so to speak, or the adjective verbs describing the main verb of washing the dishes. So that's what we have here going on in the Great Commission, this idea of making disciples and the baptizing being a key component of that. The baptizing, is, it says baptize them. Who's the them? Baptize the disciples. That word disciple is matheteo, which means just a, a, an extremely committed follower. That's what the word disciple means, whether it's used religiously or not. That's what the word means, a very extremely committed follower. Those are the ones who we are baptizing. So this verse would have us to know that we actually make disciples by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. And the baptizing, then, is how we are quantitatively, or that's, that's how we are making more disciples. After they have accepted that gift of salvation, heard the, the message of the gospel, we baptize them. And according to Acts 4.21, those that are baptized, then were added to the church. And so that's how the church grows. But then the teaching is the qualitative. You don't want them to remain baby Christians forever. We want to see people growing and maturing and furthering in their sanctification. And so the, the baptism here, basically the point of this going to the Great Commission is just for us to see that our command from Christ, our marching orders is first and foremost to make disciples, but just to have you see that baptism is actually a key part of making disciples. It should not be something that we just ignore. This is the pattern that we see even as these disciples go and start the church in the book of Acts. You see examples of this. Acts 2.38, Peter speaking to 3,000 souls at Pentecost. What does he say to them? Repent and be baptized. Acts 8.12, Philip to the people in Samaria. They believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 8.35, Philip speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch. It says he opened his mouth and began with the scriptures. He told them the good news about Jesus, and he baptized him. And so we have this pattern of preaching the gospel, followed by belief or repentance or faith, followed by baptism. Not only, I would say, not only is it our command, but it, I mean, the Great Commission is our mission. This is one of the primary purposes that God is establishing his church, is to make disciples, to go out to the world to find them, to reach them, and then baptize them and teach them. And so not only is it a command, but it's a part of our mission. As we ask the question, what are Christ followers supposed to be doing? Why does the church exist? It's to make and mature disciples. And baptizing is a significant part of that. Baptism is both a personal declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ, but it is also a corporate recognition of that faith. So if you think back to the New Testament times throughout the book of Acts, you might remember there was quite a bit of persecution happening against the apostles and these early believers and these early churches. Not very many of the towns that we see in, Acts, in the book of Acts were particularly thrilled 
to have this, this new group of Jesus followers in their towns. In fact, one passage says they, they turned the world upside down. They were literally ruining economies because people were no longer buying statues and idols. Instead, they were worshiping Jesus. And so lots of communities were not happy about this. And so for somebody to actually get baptized during that time was a public declaration of that. If somebody got baptized, there was no question whose side they were on. They were on Jesus' side. And that would have been then known by the local church in that town, which there only would have been one of. And so baptism is a personal declaration of our faith, but also a corporate recognition of that faith. Once again, Acts 2.41. So baptism is a command, and we are to obey that command. And you can think about that two different ways. We obey as individuals by submitting ourselves to baptism, by saying, yes, Lord, if you're commanding me to be baptized as a disciple, then I should do that. And so I would encourage you, if you have not yet been baptized, we would love to talk to you. You can fill out a connection card, put it in the offering box, or give it to myself, or really anybody. After the service, they'll make sure it gets to me. But we can obey by being baptized ourselves. We also obey as a church, collectively, by emphasizing and encouraging baptism with Sundays like today where we get to celebrate with those who are taking that step of obedience and following Christ in baptism. So point number one is baptism is a command. Point number two to think about this morning is that baptism is for believers. And this reality has already come up. You can hardly talk about baptism in the Bible without recognizing that baptism is for believers. It's not for those who might believe or those who should believe or maybe will believe in the future. It's not for those who simply just have parents who believe. It's for those who have believed themselves in this message of salvation. The individuals who have seen and understood the own sinfulness of their own hearts in their own inability to do anything or to gain a right standing before God and then trusting in what Christ has done on their behalf on the cross by shedding his blood in your place. Baptism is for those who have heard, understood, and received the message of Jesus Christ. This is why in the Great Commission, go and make disciples in your baptizing disciples. You're baptizing those who are committed followers of Jesus. Baptism then gives the chance for that committed follower of Christ to make that commitment public, to proclaim it to the world and also to the other believers around them. So baptism is not for those who might believe or will believe. It's also not just something that you should do if you just want to maybe feel closer to God, right? Although there is a certain aspect of when we walk in obedience to God, rather than in sin, we will naturally draw closer to him. If you don't want, just want a feeling of, man, I, I feel distant from God, maybe baptism will be the thing that fixes it. That's not really the point of baptism. It also is not to get more of God's favor in your life. Or receive more of God's grace. He's given you lavishly all of the grace, more grace than you ever deserved already through Christ on the cross. And through what we read about in Ephesians chapter 1 just moments ago. I think a lot of people get baptized for a lot of wrong reasons. And that's one of the reasons why myself and the deacons of our church actually sit down with everybody We've already sat down with everybody who's getting baptized today before they even shared with you, and we ask them questions. We want to make sure that they really understand what they're committing to and and what baptism means and what it doesn't mean. A couple years ago, I saw a YouTube clip from Bethel Church. Um, Most well-known leader of that church is Bill Johnson, and I'm, I'm not one that 
is going to call out churches and put them down very often. But in this particular example, and, and recognize this is a mega church, there's probably who knows how many different campuses and different pastors. And so there may be even variations between the campuses, but I saw a YouTube video of one of their baptism services, and they had about 20 people lined up to get baptized. And I was like, oh, that is so cool. Like, how fun would that be to have 20 people get baptized? And so they have them come up and share why they want to get baptized. They say, tell us your name and why you want to get baptized. And the first person, or not the first person, but ways down the line, one person, her name is Michaela, she gets up and says, Jesus is king, and I'm a child of God, so I want to get baptized. And that's fine. I would probably want to ask questions, just make sure she knows what it means to be a child of God. But that's fine. The next person gets up. Everybody cheers for Michaela. We're all rejoicing that she knows God and is a child of God. The next person gets up, and she says, my name is Crystal. This is a direct quote. I'm not making this up. You can look it up yourself. She says, I just know God is calling me to be a warrior for his animal kingdom, and I am led, I am supposed to lead an army of angels to pr protect animals across the world, and I know I can't do it without God. Word for word. The person interviewing her said, come on, that's amazing, and the crowd erupts in applause. Baptism should be taken a lot more seriously than that. There's lots of scriptural examples of why baptism is for believers, not for people who will believe or might believe or who want to feel better about themselves or have God leading them as they save all the animals. Acts 2.41 reminds us those who received his word were the ones that got baptized. Acts 8.12 says, When they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 9.18, immediately, this is Paul or Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. It wasn't until after he met Christ that he got baptized. He didn't get baptized and then meet Christ. It says immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Acts 16, 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. I believe this is the Philippian jailer. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before him, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. And so what we see here is a whole family who is hearing the preached word of God, responding, being baptized, and then the whole family together rejoicing that they had believed in God. If you look through scripture, you will not find one clear example of anybody being baptized before believing in Christ and his finished work on the cross. Every single instance of baptism will either directly state or heavily imply that the believing comes first and then the baptism. So baptism is a command. Baptism is for believers. And number three is baptism happens by immersion. So I think that's one of the reasons it's so fun for pastors to baptize people because you get to dunk them, right? All the way under. I remember last summer, uh, the toner boys got baptized and uh, their grandpa uh, was able to join us for that. And I, I think he was... He held one of them under a little bit longer than I was comfortable with. Um, but I guess payback for all the life they, they've taken off of his, his, yeah, anyways. The word baptize literally means to immerse. It means to submerge or dip. The, the people translating the Bible didn't actually translate this word. The Greek word is baptizo. They transliterated it. 
So instead of taking a Greek word and choosing an English word, they just took the Greek word and changed a couple letters so we could pronounce it easier in English. And so bap baptizo literally means to immerse, submerge, dunk, or dip. It's not just talking about people. It can be anything. A ship that is sunk on the bottom of the ocean is baptizoed. It's submerged. And so uh, I, sometimes my brain is kind of weird. So when I was studying for this this week, I thought, what if they would have actually translated it? What would our church name be? Would it be Ambassador Dunk Church? <laughs> Ambassador Submerged Church? Ambassador Dip Church? Soap Church? I, I don't know. But that, that's also the pattern that we see in the Bible, is that anytime we're given specific details about a baptism and what actually was happening, you see, without a, without a shadow of a doubt, it was by immersion. John 3, verse 23, and Mark 1, verse 10 is Jesus' baptism. John also was baptizing at Anion near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. And so water needed, obviously, to be plentiful in order to submerge somebody. Mark 1.10, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. He was baptized by John in the Jordan, and when he came up out of the water, came up out of the water, then the Spirit came, heavens opened. That was Jesus' baptism. Uh, perhaps the clearest example is Acts 8.38, he commanded the chariot to stop. This is the Ethiopian eunuch. He commanded the chariot to stop. It says they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And then verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And so very clear examples there of immersion. Uh, but not only is that what the word means, not only is that the example that we see in the text, but it's also representative of the symbol of what baptism represents, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so Romans 6, 3 through 4 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized unto his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's what baptism is a symbol of, and that actually is, leads us right into the fourth point that I'd like for you to consider this morning, is that baptism symbolizes the gospel. So baptism is a command, it's for believers, it's by immersion, and it symbolizes the gospel. Uh, even John the Baptist had a baptism of repentance. His whole message was repent, turn from yourself in your own religion or your own ways, and prepare your hearts for Christ, turn away from sin and towards Christ, even though he wasn't even there yet. It was a baptism of repentance. 1 Corinthians 15, I uh, referenced this passage earlier, but Paul sends a letter to those Corinthians and says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture. He was buried and was raised again on the third day. That is... The gospel. The gospel is simply that we are sinners. Romans tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans tells us the wages of that sin, the result, the penalty, what we deserve because of that sin is death. And also Romans tells us there is none righteous, none who seek after God. And so in our own sinfulness, we are incapable of really doing anything about it. And so... God then looks upon sin and being a perfectly just God, he has to punish sin, but being a perfectly loving God, he wants to give grace and mercy, but there's no way to do that for these imperfect people. And that's why he has to send Jesus on the cross where his perfect justice and perfect love collide and the payment for our sin is paid in full through the blood of Jesus Christ, because he was the perfect lamb. One of our testimonies this morning, he had questions. Why, why was there all these sacrifices in the Old Testament? Well, they were pointing towards the ultimate sacrifice 
of Christ for us. The once for all sacrifice of Christ. And so baptism is an outward symbol of our inward reality. Therefore, it doesn't really make logical sense to apply this symbol to somebody who hasn't already received its meaning. Football season is coming up, and uh, I'm going to proudly wear my Hawkeyes gear and my Chicago Bears gear all season long, even though all the Vikings fans don't like it. I'm still going to wear it. You can, you can put on a jersey as proof that you are a fan, that you're a follower of a specific team. But I would argue putting that same type of paraphernalia onto your baby, who is one year old and doesn't even know what football is, does not make him a fan. The same is true of a wedding ring. I'm married whether I have this ring on or not, but I want people to know I'm married. I'm proud to be married to my wife, and so I wear my ring. Hopefully that doesn't get any of you guys in trouble (laughs) for not wearing your ring as much as you should. I'm sure I would be getting the eye if, if my wife was in here, she's in the nursery, but... But yeah, the, the, once again, the pattern that we see throughout Acts and throughout the New Testament is the gospel's preached, people believe first, and then they're baptized and added to the church. And so uh, just one other, quickly, one other thing, and I mentioned this when we were here in the baptisms, and I mentioned how we as a church want to collectively recognize the salvation of these people and and bring them into our local body of believers here. I want it to be something that the church is owning, not something that I'm doing as a pastor. And part of the reason for that is is as baptism is is an outward symbol of our inward reality, what happens when we accept Christ is that uh, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says we become baptized into the body of Christ. So at salvation, we are now a part of the universal body of believers. And uh, that is is true. You can look up 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We become immersed into Christ's body. But Christ in his sovereignty has set it up that the universal or the spiritual church, that collection of all believers across all times and all spaces would have its practical outworking in local churches. So the the New Testament would know of no believer who was not connected to a local church, a church in their own town. And so for somebody to be spiritually baptized but not a part of a local church would be incongruous in the New Testament. That would, not, that would not exist. That would be like somebody saying, I, I play in the NFL, and then you ask them, oh, what team do you play for? Oh, well, I don't have an actual team. I just play in the NFL. <laughs> no, you you got to belong to something in order to actually play, in order actually to work out your salvation, in order to live out those one another's, in order to do all the things that Christ has called us to with uh, spurring one another onto love and good works and receiving accountability and discipleship and encouragement. That happens within the context of the local church. And so just as in, in our spiritual baptism into the body of Christ, we are ushered into that universal church, we like to as much as possible also direct those who are being physically baptized, expressing that outwardly, that symbol of their inward reality. We want that inward reality of their belonging to the universal church to have practical ways of showing itself within the local church. And so that's why we we so often try to combine these ideas of church membership with uh, church baptism. 
So baptism is a command. It's for believers by immersion, and it symbolizes the gospel. So what? Right? So what? A couple takeaways for you this morning. First of all, have you obeyed? I'm not even talking about baptism. I'm talking about repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. This morning we heard testimonies of individuals who are 100% confident that if they died today, they would be with Jesus. 100% confident that their sins are forgiven because of what Christ has done for them. I wonder, are you 100% confident? Have you first and foremost listened to the message of the gospel and received it, believed it, put your trust in Christ's work to forgive you of your sins rather than anything you can do on your own? If you haven't done that, can I just encourage you to talk to whoever you came with or fill out one of our connection cards in the seats in front of you? We would love nothing more today than to talk to you more about that. So have you responded to the call of the gospel? But secondly, have you obeyed this command to be discipled or to be baptized? Are you walking in obedience in that way? excited to publicly, as these seven individuals this morning are publicly, say, I'm a, I'm a child of God. I want the world to know it. I want the church to know it. And I want to do this thing together. Have you been baptized? Next, I would just encourage you, if you have done both of those things, to allow the events of today to encourage you to reflect on the glory of the gospel. What a beautiful thing that Christ would die for sinners. Scarcely for a good man would anybody dare to die. But maybe somebody would. Yet God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, the worst of the worst, he loved us and died for us. So obey the gospel. Obey this command to be baptized. Be encouraged to reflect on the glory of the gospel and then allow the events of today to motivate you towards Great Commission living. These Sundays are exciting. They're fun. They're encouraging. Wouldn't it be fun to have one of these once a month? Just got so many people being baptized and coming to know Christ that we got to do these monthly. That would be awesome. Let's, let's strive to make disciples. And then finally, I would just encourage you this morning to rejoice with, encourage, and celebrate with those who are being baptized today. It's a special day uh, for these individuals, and uh, we want to come around them and surround them with the love of Ambassador Baptist Christ and the love of Christ himself uh, as they get baptized. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the time here this morning. We thank you for uh, just the chance to look real quickly into your word uh, and just see what it has to say about baptism. There's lots of other things that could be said, uh, but hopefully this morning we have a, a fresh reminder of just how special and, and how personal the gospel is in our lives and also how um, uh, just how meaningful baptism really actually is. And so we are thrilled to be able to celebrate with these seven individuals this morning. We just, we give you all the glory, all the praise in Jesus name. Amen.